Hi, class, and welcome to American History. That's uh, 405. I am Professor Moore, and I'm super excited to be with you guys this semester as we learn all about the history of the United States. All right, so each week we will have office hours. Those are Tuesdays from 2 to 4 p.m. Central Standard Time and Sundays from 10 a.m. to 12 p.m. Central Standard Time. And uh, these are not mandatory meetings that you have to come to. These are just simply times that if you want to catch me live and you want to talk to me in person that you can get me. Of course, I'm always available by email. I check emails pretty much every day a week. The only exception is that uh, because the animals would, we're, uh, and the weather is nice right now, we usually ha are booked on Saturdays with them doing different types of stuff and taking them to different places. So you may not get me on Saturdays. However, if you absolutely do need me, Call me, leave me a message, and when we get home, I will definitely call you back. But uh, just to let you know, you know, email me for anything, guys. Reach out for anything. If you do call the house, make sure that you leave me a message so that I know that you have called. And uh, any anything you need, guys, I'm here for you. I'm sorry, yeah, my goodies are all going off for some reason. All right, so we have announcements in class. It's important that you make sure that you uh, check those uh, when you get into class. So it's recommended at least be in class two days each week. That's what we do for the uh, discussions, or th that's the uh, requirement for the discussions. And my suggestion is that when you log in those two days to get your discussions in, check the announcements. That's where I'll post lectures, I'll post a uh, guidances, any other information or, or things that we need in class. I'll always post, the, uh, um, you know, when I have uh, graded stuff, I'll put that in, in the announcements. I always put a note up there so you guys know and you don't need to wonder where your feedback or what your grades are. And uh, speaking of that, grading for discussions will always be done by midnight Tuesday. Grading for assignments will always be done by midnight Friday. Okay, guys? So, because we are on, on online and we don't meet in person, our discussions are a really important part of the class. That's where, of course, you know, we will expand our knowledge on the uh, topics we're talking about each week. And, you know, those discussions can also help you with assignments that are due in their respective week. So, it's important that you get those two paste, uh, posts in two days each week. So, um, although it's not like a requirement where you'll get, po you know, late points if you don't post on Wednesday, the university does recommend that we get our initial post done by Wednesday, and then we have Sunday to get in that participation post. And because, like I said, you know, there, there will be information in the discussions that you can use in your assignment, I do encourage you guys not to wait until the last day to get in there and engage uh, your peers and me in the participation. Of course, though, I understand that everybody's schedule is a little different, but just make sure two days each week. And then um, make sure that you are including your APA element. So a good rule of thumb is to always have one citation per paragraph, and then you have the matching reference at the bottom. And you guys, you know, look at the way that I do my posts and I include those APA elements. Look at the way I do that in uh, our weekly guidances and, you know, use those as models. And then um, if, you're, if you're ever in doubt of how to do something in APA, reach out to me guys i have no problem helping you set up sources i have no problem going to the library and helping you look for sources to use for uh you know for your discussions and assignments in class and just uh, like i said reach out to me for anything all right so this is a map of our modern world, so uh, it's not really so important. I know it's it's actually a political map, but that's not what's important. What's important with, uh, you know, looking at this uh, map 
we get started with American history is that this is where we're at today. All right, guys. So in the past, before America was discovered, we have here, uh, this is Sebastian Munster's map of the New World in 1540. And so we see a lot different depiction of the world because, you know, knowledge of all the different continents and all the islands and all of that wasn't really known at this time. And so when Europeans first began their overseas exploration and we see, you know, our our hemisphere being like the Euro Eurasia content, African content, you know, the the uh, uh, Asian countries, you know, Europe had already explored all of those and knew about those. But, you know, the United States and actually what we should say the Americas, because it includes, you know, the whole continent from um, up in the the tundra there of Canada, way down to the tip of South America. You know, that was all really undiscovered country for the most part because uh, Europeans didn't really know about that. Of course, there are, you know, the more we learn with archaeology, the more we see that there was probably exploration of the American continent before the 1400s and before, you know, Columbus so-called discovered America. He didn't really discover America. He was just kind of more of like, I, I would like to say that he rediscovered it because, you know, there's evidence that even way before then that uh, different cultures had been in contact with each other and that uh, different cultures had actually been on the American continent. And then of course, we had the Native people, Native Americans, that already lived here. And then once again, that goes for South America, too. And so when Europe and the Native Americans, you know, they first met with each other, it was pretty strange, pretty alien. Um, Europeans, they struggled to make sense of the worlds they discovered. And then, of course, the Indians, they were, you know, struggling with who these newcomers were and what their motives were and what their demands were as far as the colonists and the Native American uh, relationships went, right? And so we see a lot of violence um, in, in the beginning with these initial contact. And uh, we also see a lot of exchange of technology, food, pathogens, ideas, and styles. And, you know, the Indians and the European, they would fight, fight and kill each other. But then they also, you know, they found ways to cooperate and accommodate each other even though, you know, we, we still kind of struggle with that a little bit when it comes to cultural groups that live here in the United States. We pretty much, we, we have people from all over the world, right? All sorts of different uh, cultures live here in the United States, which is, you know, that's why we're called the melting pot of diversity. But out of those, Native Americans are still pretty much at the bottom of the totem pole and, and, and um many, many incidences and, and many reasons, you know, we won't go into all of that, though. And so with I really like this picture. This is a 16th century uh, depiction of uh, the Native women in the southeastern part of the United States. And so we see that um, farming was, uh, uh, well, farming was a big part of their way of life, especially, you know, in the southeast and the northeast. Once you get more to, like, the plains and the west, they had more, um, a little bit more diversity because of the different animals and plants that, that were out there. And so when it comes to the native cultures in America, um, there are about 2,000 separate cultures. There are, you know, several hundred languages. And then, like I said, because of the diversity of environments here in the United States and in South America, you know, lots of different ways that people were adapting and, and living in their environments. And uh, when we look at the 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 native peoples of america you know we don't e even though we we tend to over time we have tend to kind of lump them all together and classify them as kind of one group and and don't really look at their individual diversity 
people in North America, they 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 were no single physical characterization for them. You know, they had a range of skin color. They had a, like I said, a diversity of, uh, a, you know, a re- well, not diversity. Let's go with range of languages that they spoke. Um, their belief systems were different, although, you know, similar in many aspects because Native people, pretty much all Native cultures, even us as European people in Asia, people in Africa, you know, always, uh, you know, they, they were focused on nature and living in harmony with, the, with uh, you know, the natural world and animals around them. You know, that's something that we all share no matter where we come from as our ancestors, because we all started out as those nature-oriented uh, types of groups, right, before industrialization, right? And, um <clears throat> And so, uh, of course, when uh, Europeans in, in, in the 14th century first got to the so-called New World, they thought it was part of the Asian co- uh, continent. And that was kind of the whole point, was trying to find a quicker route to get to the southeastern Asian islands and uh, get those resources like the spices and the silk and the porcelain. And so... Once they uh, realized that these were this was a whole new group of people and cultures that they were experiencing, then you know you got these debates on well, how did these these people get here? Where did they come from? Who made them? Because of course, at the time, Europeans they were very, um, in, you know, very religiously motivated, especially you know the Christian religion, and so um. They they were, you know, a lot of debates over, you know, how they fit in to the whole Bible creation story. And then um, you know, at the same time too, Europeans, they were trying they would compare them to uh African and Asian cultures. And uh so like I said, farming was a big part of uh the American continents here and um Maize farming was actually one of the earliest for was when one of the earliest domesticated crops here in the Americas. And we say that it was probably about two thousand five hundred years ago, but really it was probably longer than that. I mean, we have that traditional idea that people cross from a you know, there in the beginning of the Ice Age, from about twelve thousand years ago. People walked across the Bering Straits and then that's how this continent became populated, but uh, archaeology has shown us that there are ideas of people migrating as far back as 80,000 years ago, 60,000, 80,000 years ago, so I think that's pretty cool. I'm like, I'm, I'm pretty sure that there probably were, you know, people here and interacting with each other um, a lot longer than that Bering Strait idea because, you know, you, you just see it. And uh, it, it's uh, it's kind of weird when it comes to history. You know, we have the this chronology and these stories that that are pretty common. But at the same time, as we learn more about the past, you know, we're learning that those stories aren't quite correct. And and you know, they follow a specific um, narrative that that we get taught, especially like in you know grade school and high school. But you know, the more we learn about the past, the more we discover the changing narrative of that story, and the more we discover about all the different cultures within that story. Right, guys? <clears throat> and so when it came to farming, um, some of the staple crops here in the America that, that kind of started are indigenous to the Americas, corn, beans, squash, peppers, and tomatoes. And we seem to think that those first came out of Mexico. So in the kind of that middle part of the continent there. And so what we see in this picture, this is Cahokia, and Cahokia was, uh, um, w- is one of the most prominent mound sites for the Mississippian culture. So when the Europeans 
first got here to America, that the Mississippian culture, as you see on our map there, they kind of were in control of a lot of the America here as far as the like uh, Southeast, especially, and, uh, you know, more this Eastern side of the continent. And uh, many archaeologists believe that if the Spanish would have held off at least another 30 years before they encountered the Mississippian culture, that the Mississippian culture probably uh, more than likely would have been more advanced to, to, than the Europeans, and so they would have had better technology, and we wouldn't have seen that, uh, you know, decimation of the native people because of, uh, you know, diseases and pathogens, which is really the thing that, uh, you know, decimated the native cultures here. And, um, and so um, the mound builders, yeah, so like I said, they, they, they had these extensive trade networks. They were pretty much, you know, the, the main group that was in charge here in, in the, you know, the groups that the first uh, colonists and the first explorers, conquistadors, you know, the Spanish explorers encountered. And then um, also... Well, let's see. Hang on. I'm looking at uh, my, my notes here. And so with the Mississippian society, you know, basically we see uh, new technologies emerging as far as the history of the native people goes here in the United States. So, you know, bow and arrow gets created. Uh, we have... Um, other mound sites in the United States. Let me go back to that. So other mound sites in the United States. There's also, um, they're, they're mostly in Ohio, Tennessee, Georgia, Alabama, and Oklahoma. And uh, the Serpent Mound in Ohio, that was one of the, uh, it's one of the largest effigies in the world. And um, it really just proves that just the uh, ingenuity and kind of prowess of the native people. So for my master's degree, that's what I studied. I did history and culture, and I was looking specifically at the Mississippian culture and at their mount, and at mound building and how that not only connected people to nature, but it also was a community type thing because, you know, in order to build these massive mound structures that they did, they had to have everybody working together and cooperating. And uh, I have been to most of the major sites from uh, old Ohio to Alabama, Georgia, Mississippi to Texas. You know, I, I, I traveled around and went and visit as many of them that I could. And then, of course, when it comes to the Native people here in the United States, um, like I said, you know, they weren't all just one group. Everybody was doing their own thing. And so with these pictures, we see some of the different types of structures that they would live in depending upon their environment. So we have a longhouse, which is that bottom left. We have a wigwam, which is that one on top, and then a teepee. And... Um, like I said, a lot, of, well, like I said, you know, depending on where you lived is how you built your house. And the interesting thing is that a lot of the times it was the women of the group that would build the structures that people were, that people were living in. And so um, when Europeans first got to North, uh, uh, to the Americas, we say that there was probably as many as 50 million people that were living here. And of course, you know, of course, uh, scholars, scientists, they, they kind of archaeologists, they kind of argue over those numbers. But, you know, there's no doubt that there were, you know, groups of people living all over this continent. And, um, and then, uh, like I said, you know, depending on their environment was how they were going to live. So, you know, like here in the, uh, well, where I'm at in the southeastern part of the United States, farming, foraging, hunting were a, a big part of their subsistence pattern. But then when you get out to places like California or Florida, you know, where you're along the close, coast, fishing would have been a main source of uh, subsistence for people. 
And then when we get to the Spanish conquistadors, they were one of the first groups that arrived here in the United States, and uh, much they and uh, span the Spanish uh, conquistadors. They pretty much got here between like 1513 and by uh, 1543. They were kind of already all over the place, but really. The Spanish kind of focused more on the southeast and the southwestern parts of the United States. And then, of course, um, because of the difference in genetics and immunity, we lost, a, even though there was a lot of violence in the beginning perpetuated by the Europeans upon the Native Americans, we also see smallpox. So um, smallpox was a, a big thing that wiped out a lot of the Native population. And it's interesting because of that, and uh, because of genetics, that is, um, that's one of the reasons why the slave trade started here in the United States, because a lot, especially when you get to South America, the environment is very much like Africa. And so Europeans realize that uh, even though, you know, they were kind of contagious to the native people here, bringing the folks over from Africa, they were already kind of immune to a lot of the diseases. And because they've already been interacting with uh, the Europeans, they were immune to their diseases. So just a little interesting side fact there. So one of the first European colonies here to the United States was Roanoke and Sir Walter Riley. Um, and so, you know, it was one of, this is one of those uh, colonies that ended up becoming the lost colony because they're not really sure what happened to the inhabitants. By the time I think they came, it was maybe a... Um, it was a few decades later that more uh, colonists came over, and when they discovered Roanoke, it was like nobody was there, so they don't know if it's because it had to do with conflict with the Indians. They're not sure if maybe they just, you know, the, the residents of Roanoke could not adapt to the new world living, and so, you know, it's possible that maybe just everybody died or, you know, they, they wouldn't work with the natives to learn about how to adequately farm and grow food, and so maybe starvation, you know, nobody really knows. But we know that when it comes to, we could call it the colonization of America or the invasion of America, you know, there was a lot of violence, but at the same time, you know, there was a lot of accommodation and cooperation between Native groups and the newcomers. The French are a good example of that. When the French came here, they were mostly into fishing and hunting and especially like a uh, the fur trade, and so the French were smart, you know, they buddied up with the Indians and wanted to learn, you know, the environment and the layout and the different animals so that they can, you know, get those furs, those pelts, so then they can ship them back overseas and sell them. And so you see there in the beginning, it was a lot of uh, Frenchmen marrying Indian women and, and you know, so that's kind of one of, one of the uh, more peaceful uh Togethering of the different cultures. And then, like we said, of course, though, you know, contact with exploration and even brief settlement here in the American continent. It took place long before Columbus's first voyage here, but, uh, you know, it was his voyage that had the most profound impact and consequences. And, you know, that is uh, led us to that understanding of the transformation of Europe in the centuries before Columbus is essential background knowledge. But it also helped, you know, it's also a key part in history because this is really when we started documenting what was going on here in the Americas. And, of course, for these colonists coming here, to America, there there was, you know, it's very agriculture, it's very feudal system, and then uh, the Roman Catholic, especially with the Spanish, you know, they, they really, um, you know, were very predominant 
over the different colonies. And, uh, you know, there in the beginning, it wasn't easy for the Europeans coming here. There was a lot of famine and, uh, you know, those living, adjusting to the different environments was really hard for people. But by the 1500s, we actually see about 65 million Europeans living here in the United States. And, uh, you know, since Western Europe was officially Christian, like we said, you know, the Catholic Church really played a crucial role in these colonies and you know that was kind of a once again a bad thing for the native peoples be it here in the northern part of america or down in south america because uh, the catholic church was really cruel at this time and uh you know they would persecute what they considered heretics and non-believers so basically with the indians what they would do it's like if you don't convert to christianity we're just going to kill you and so a lot of the missions in texas it's kind of sad. They have a lot of graveyard, kind of like uh, the Holocaust and, and the concentration camps. There are just these massive graveyards where they would just dump the Native American people because they didn't did not want to convert to Catholicism. And so, you know, the only option was death. It was like convert or die. However, though, when it comes to economic growth, um, that was fueled by agriculture expansion and uh, that's really the whole reason for why Europe was coming to the Americas is they were looking for that commercial expansion you know they they were creating these trade routes so so they could send stuff back to uh, Europe and so you know that kind of created this expansion and growth of markets and towns and uh, we also see that this led to intellectual and technological growth of Europe and uh, we also see that you know these exchanges with Asia the Middle East um, being here in the Americas, this is what kind of triggered the Renaissance, and it helped, you know, create a more artistic and scientific revolution. We see growth in communication um, pathways. Um, we see universities being created and uh, new ideas uh, being formed. So, you know, this is kind of when the Renaissance, so it was after Europeans got here to the Americas that we see the Renaissance start over in Europe, you know, which which actually started in um, Italy. And, uh, you know, that, that growth of this, the, you know, the Renaissance, which is really this idea of humanism, this human-centered perspective and curiosity about the world around them, you know, that played a critical role in motivating a, a exploration here to North America. And then we have to also, and so then, you know, to kind of backstep a little bit, but, you know, that's one of the reasons why it was so revolutionary and uh, for Europeans to come here and why we have all these new technologies and ideas being created, because we have to go back a little further. We have to look at what was going on in Europe. And, you know, Europe was just coming out of the bubonic plague, which killed a lot of people off. And uh, so by the 1500s, Hundreds, we see, and, and you know, during the plague time, people were still in those medieval states in Europe. So, you know, even though we, we still see a little bit of feudalism here in the beginning of colonization with uh, the American continent, we also, once again, you know, we see these new ideas and these new ways of living and of being human start to come out. And it was also a way for uh, regrowth of the population, right? And then, like I said, so, uh, you know, the Spanish, the Portuguese, it was actually the Portuguese, they're the first ones that set out um, on European exploration. And then, you know, because they're right next to Spain, they ended up, you know, that's then why Spain started venturing out too. And so the Portuguese, Henry the Navigator, he was the first one to sail around Africa to re reach the West Indies. And, and, of course, that's where they established 
several colonies and uh they uh, later were one of the or later after well several colonies there in africa and then after that they became uh, pretty predominant in india and they're actually the guys that started the atlantic slave train and uh, one of the good, one of the things about the Portuguese, the way that they contributed to uh, other countries, uh, European countries, actually coming out. Sorry, guys, I know the guineas are going off. I have no idea how loud they're going to be once I publish this. But uh, they, they uh, really, we we credit them for their uh, new ideas and technology when it comes to uh, ships. They they actually came up with new navigational techniques, even though a lot of the techniques and, uh, tech, uh, well, techniques as far as navigation goes, a lot of the instruments that they would use, they, they you know, they originally came from Asia and the Asian continent and the Asian islands there. And so when Europeans first got over there, that that's where they found those. So things like an astronaut Lobe, which is this really like cool, um, really sophisticated compass that just helps you get around better, right? <clears throat> oh, oops. All right, and then by the time we see Columbus reach America, this is where. Uh, you know, he, he originally went to the Portuguese uh, um, government and wanted them to fund this uh, his, his journey to what he thought was going to be, you know, what, uh, Asia, but ended up being the United States. And so that's when he went to Ferdinand and Isabel of uh, Spain, and uh, they were able to fund that. And so we kind of all know that story. Um, Columbus, even, uh, he never even stepped foot on the American continent. You know, he was, uh, he actually got to the islands. He got to the Bahamas first. And, uh, you know, he did kind of have these imperialistic goals. You know, the idea was to come and con conquer, conquest, and uh, secure the resources to take back to Spain. And then once again, because he thought it was the new, you know, he thought it was somewhere else, he described it as the new world. And then we have America Vespucci, who is where America got its name from. He was a cartographer, so he was a map maker. So he came over here and he started, uh, uh, you know, exploring and traveling around and he was making the maps of what the continent looked like. And that's where this idea of a new world came about. And so, uh, since the Spanish were one of the first to come here to the Americas, you know, they had a lot of imperial control. And so, even though at the same time, and once again, you know, the Catholic Church really had a strong hand in uh, dictating what was going on here. At the same time, because they were so far away, there was a lot of local anonym, uh, autonomy. And so, um, you know, the Spaniards, the Spaniards, they had careful control over their colonies and the people who lived there. And they had a type of class system, too. So, you know, that's where they, you know, of course, if you were indigenous, you were at the bottom of the caste system, and then if you were the local leader, then, you know, you were pretty much like a king in your own little area of the world. And, you know, that that's a strange thing for humans is that that's one of the things in psychology we look at. We're like, why does power corrupt so many people? You know, people get this little sense of power, and then, you know, for the most part, you see a lot of bad things that tend to happen. It's like power really does corrupt and go to people's heads. All right, and so with this slide, we're just looking at these different kind of trade routes and, and the movements of the different types of plants, animal diseases that, uh, you know, of course, led to the development of modern history.
And then when the Spanish first got here, uh, St. Augustine, Florida is actually one of the oldest settlements in the United States. And uh, they kind of failed in their attempts with Florida because if you've ever been to Florida, you know, it's super humid super swampy and uh, you know they just weren't really able to survive and then we have uh, and so so they started venturing further into the heart of the southeastern part of the United States there. And so we have Ferdinand de Soto and, uh, you know, he spread a lot of disease among the southeastern Indians, but uh, he was also just a really bad guy. He would burn villages alive when people would not tell him where gold was and, and they didn't really have any gold, even though here in the southeast, the uh, this part of the Appalachian Mountains, there are a lot of gemstones, and uh, of course, back in that time, I'm sure there was probably even more. But uh, they're they're you know here in the southeast, they're really known for gemstones and stuff like that. But they just didn't have this imagined gold and wealth that uh, the Spanish conquistadors thought that they would have. But you know, of course, they didn't believe the people telling him, "We don't know what you're talking about, dude." And so he'd burn people alive. He would keep this. Um, a pack of it was either Irish wolfhounds or Irish settler dogs with him, and he would feed the Indians when they wouldn't tell him what he wanted. He would feed them to him, and it's just kind of kind of some insane and cruel stuff that uh, the first explorers and uh, these conquistadors were doing to the people that lived here. And then, you know, eventually we see the conquistadors make their way to the southwest because, once again, they were looking for these lost city of gold and, uh, you know, this this imaginary wealth that they thought these native people have. And uh, so, you know, a lot of life just from uh, delusions of grandeur, definitely. And what we see with the Spanish is that um, it was mostly men that were coming over here. You know, we did have uh, a little bit of women would would accompany them, but for the most part, it was men. And, uh, you know, by the late 16th century, you know, the Spanish had really uh, uh, dominated of the Americas and, uh, you know, in, in the colonies here. And then, um, like I already said, so the French, we know that the French, they were really about trade and not conquest when they got here to the Americas. And uh, we see the fishing grounds of Nova Scotia, because that's kind of closest to Europe. That really attracted the European fishermen, and uh, we kind of see that well before Columbus got here. And, uh, you know, both... The, Fr uh, the French and the English, they sent explorers back to the region to, guess, to investigate possible places for settlement, trade route, and new and, you know, new types of goods that, that they could uh, then bring back to Europe and sell. And, of course, we're, once again, we're talking about, like, pre-industrialization. So it was all about, you know, getting these different products. It was kind of... It, it, just that pre-industrialization, but it was pretty much the beginning of commercialism because everybody wanted to get this new stuff that they didn't necessarily have in Europe. And, and so, you know, once again, with these people coming to trade, they establish, they establish much better relationships with the native people here. And so we always think of um, one of the common ideas is that, oh, the Indians were stupid and, you know, you would just give them like a, a, um, a bracelet of beads and they'd end up giving you all this stuff that was worth more than that. But in actuality, you know, the Indian people here in the United States, they had a sharp eye for quality goods. And, uh, you know, this cutthroat competition among the traders provided them opportunities to hold out for the best price. So, you know, they weren't stupid. They weren't not ignorant like we commonly think. And so uh, what did that do? 
and trade, trade was already an unequal exchange favoring the Europeans, but, you know, at the same time, it, well, I'm sorry, so it was, you know, it was in favor of the Europeans, and, you know, that then created conflict among the different tribes living here because you know everybody wanted to once it just just like the european you know we're, we're all human if uh you know someone's benefiting from some type of social economic interaction well then you know you want your group to be able to benefit from that too so we see intertribal fighting and then you know uh competition for access to hunting grounds and uh you know that just allowed or, or that just caused the native people to become more dependent on those European goods, things like knives, kettles, and then firearms. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, but once again, disease, um, war, wars among each other, wars with, you know, the, the Europeans that, you know, was in the end very detrimental to the native population. And then, of course, when the Europeans first started coming here, we also see that uh, they, they would quarrel with the Spanish a lot, too, because, you know, it, it, that stems from religious wars in Europe, you know, between, like, the Protestants. So, so you know, we're just coming out of the Protestants and the Catholics having their wars over in Europe, the Spanish Inquisition. And so, of course, for the Spanish, it was all about they're getting this land for the Pope and, and for the real Christian religion. And, you know, the Protestants were like, no, no, no. We're the ones that are the real um a Christian religion, and then, you know, you have these kind of uh, ragtag groups. That's really what the Puritans were. You know, the Puritans had different Quakers. These guys had different ideas than the predominant Protestant and, and even Lutheran and Roman Catholics in, in Europe, and they actually were kicked out of Europe. Everybody thought that they were so radical that nobody wanted them in Europe. And so before they even got to the Americas, they had uh, ventured out of England and had been around a few other another northern European continents there, and everybody was like, nah, you guys are just kind of weird, so why don't, why don't you see if you can make it over there to the United States? At the same time, though, because those groups did make it here and uh, they, they developed the colonies that they did, we, we know that some of their religious ideas, you know, did take a hold here in the United States and some of the way our, um, our Declaration of Independence and governmental systems were set up had a lot to do with some of their ideologies. You really kind of see that a lot here in the southeastern part of the United States, too, because uh, like Southern Baptists, for example, they like to do the revivals and and, uh, you know, they have these kind of long church services that involve a lot of community like picnicking afterwards, which is kind of what revivals are. They, they're like these week long, month long type religious events where everybody gets to come together and worship with each other. And that actually was something that the Puritans started. All right, guys. So that pretty much is uh, just a quick overview of the beginning colonization of the United States. These different groups that, you know, already lived here, these different groups that were coming in. And, um, the you know just a little introduction to uh the beginning of the culture that we live in so you know once again there were a lot of clashes with, because of contact and in these different groups learning how to work with each other you know a lot of uh, a lot of loss to the uh, native populations. You know, we see the beginning of the slave trade, and and you know that all has to go back to this commercial economic ideas of you know that's why Europe started venturing out of of, of the European part of Eurasia their continent right is because they were looking for these economic opportunities and you know it wasn't so much 
that they they started out with the intention of we're going to go to these other parts of the world and we're just going to kill everybody and take all their stuff even though they did that a lot it um it was more about how do we show that we're more powerful? You know, Spain had just been uh, actually established as its own independent country. Um, you know, Great Britain, England was just is, is just a small little ir uh, island, and you know they of course you have Ireland, you have Wales, Scotland. They're all and you know they're they're actually on the English island, but Ireland you know is an island that's pretty close. So those guys were all fighting with each other, trying to establish dominance and control. You have you know the Roman Catholics coming and dominating Europe, and uh, you have you, we see Germany and France always trying to dominate um, the European con uh, continent. And then you know once again we have the plague that came through and pretty much wiped everybody out so you know at the time these european countries the rulers they felt justified in uh these economic endeavors that they were going in because they were trying to establish them as you know the big person on the block who had all the power and all the toys and so then that just gives us a little psychology of history too because we're like well, why why did they do things like that and you know it's really hard to say but like i said earlier you know there's something about human nature as humans we are beautiful and grotesque the same time and uh you know it's through looking at our past that we can see the beauty we see the grossness but it's also a way for us to learn and figure out those new more positive and productive ways that we can engage each other and uh, we can make everybody feel like they are part of the world that we are living in because we all are part of the world that we were living in, and the world's going to be a lot better. And well, not better. I hate to say better because those kind of sets up kind of it's, it's like saying something is perfect. You know, there's no such thing as perfect, but we can definitely find ways to be more positive and productive so that we are working together. And why is that important? Because as we see with history, you know, even though we had these clashes with these different cultures and we had a lot of life, loss of life, a lot of uh, probably technology and culture was lost. At the same time, we see these beautiful things emerge. You know, we see these new scientific discoveries. We see these new ways of living life and of doing things. And so, you know, and that, that can help us in the modern world learn how to find those new ways that's going to hopefully, you know, help us all move forward. And once again, to throw in a little psychology, it would be to help us sexual uh, self actualize and uh, basically what that means in a nutshell is just uh be the best versions of ourselves that we can be and you know do the best for ourselves and our families and for everybody else that lives on this planet and in our little bubble that we can because we only get one life one opportunity to be here on this planet and uh, you know why not make the best of that so all right guys that wraps up the first part of our lecture. And uh, like I said, I'm excited to be here, learn about American history for all of you guys. And if you need anything, just reach out to me. All right, thanks, bye.